Very good. Wow. Look at all these questions. It shows how peaceful you're getting. <laughs> so many questions. But before I start today, I wanted to mention a particular point of Dhamma, a particular technique, which is very useful. I meant to mention it last night in a talk on mindfulness, but uh, I ran out of time and it was important to have a few Q&A. Uh, so <coughs> it's something which I have mentioned during the interviews to a few of you and I want you to investigate this and actually make use of it because it's a wonderful way of establishing mindfulness especially in the deeper states of meditation it's what I call programming mindfulness just using the simile from uh, computing when uh, when uh, you get into deep meditation it's very difficult to do anything in particular that sometimes you get so deep in meditation you can't come out you're sitting there very happily and there's no way that you can form the intention to actually to rise out of your meditation get off your seat and maybe go to work so sometimes people are a bit concerned what happens if I'm meditating early in the morning and I get into a deep state of meditation and I am late for work and get the sack. <coughs> the point is that what you need to do is this uh, technique I call programming mindfulness. If you are, have got deep meditation, your good meditation, you can start getting into these quiet and peaceful states. What you should do is the very beginning of the meditation, just after you've sat down, made yourself comfortable, and before you take up your meditation object, you should make a resolution, a determination, that I will come out of this meditation at such and such a time. Or you can say, I will sit meditation for such and such a length of time. Either will do. But let's just say, I, you'll say to yourself, I must come out of meditation by 7 a.m. <coughs> so that I can uh, get in the car and go to work, say. All you need to do is to repeat that to yourself <coughs> very carefully and very precisely. And I usually do it to myself three times. I must come out of meditation at 7 a.m. I must come out of meditation at 7 a.m. I must come out of meditation at 7 a.m. You say it precisely and you listen. What happens then? You forget about it. You leave it alone and you go off and do your normal meditation. When it gets to 7 a.m., the thought will come up, it's time to come out of my meditation. And you will come out of your meditation. The program has been put in to your mind. The mind remembers it, it's got its own clock, and you'll come out at that time, with one or two minutes either side. It's remarkable just how well that uh, works. If you don't believe me, uh, this evening, and I'll remind you about this later on this evening, because I won't forget this, because now I'm going to say to myself, Ajahn Brahm, this evening after the Dhamma talk, I must remind the students about programming the mind to wake up in the morning. I must remind the students to program their mind for waking up in the morning. I must tell my students to program the mind about waking up in the morning. I put that program in my brain now. This evening after the talk, that thought will come up, and I will remind you to program your mind to get up. What I mean there is when you go to bed tonight, when you're sort of laying down, you're reasonably comfortable, then you make a resolution. Say you get up at five o'clock, usually. You can re make a resolution. I will get up at five minutes to five. I will wake up at five minutes to five. I will wake up at five minutes to five. You make that resolution to yourself as clearly as possible. And you forget about it and drift off into sleep you will be amazed. You wake up in the morning, you don't need an alarm clock, you don't need a bell. You wake up in the morning, one or two minutes, either side of five minutes to five. It's incredible just how well that works. I learned that technique on my first meditation retreat and I was amazed how accurate it was. And so having learned that, if I have an appointment, I don't need to put it down on a palm pilot. I put it down on my mind pilot. I just say to myself, I must remember to give you know, so-and-so a call at 3 p.m. tomorrow afternoon. 
I must remember to call so and so at 3 p.m. I must remember to call so and so at 3 p.m. And I just go about my tasks, and then I might be sort of talking to people, ask their, asking their problems, and at 3 p.m. the thought comes up, oh, you must remember to call so and so. It works every time. So it means I don't have to worry about things, you no know, tying strings around my finger or you know, asking other people to remind me. I know how to program my mind. And that's also useful if you have any problems in your meditation. For example, if you get to a certain point, you start getting peaceful, and then you start thinking too much. All you need to do, once you can identify that problem, you tell yourself, when I get to that stage, I will not go off thinking. When I get to that stage, I will not go off thinking. When I get to that stage, I will not go off thinking. So all you do, you tell yourself that. Now what happens, you're meditating along, when you get to that stage, that instruction will come up into your mind automatically. It will tell you, stop thinking. And that's actually how you can train yourself. It's amazing how it works. In life, if you've got someone who always makes you upset, for example, your husband or your wife, (laughs) and you always tend to sort of say the wrong things, you program yourself, next time, I get upset at my husband. I will say something kind. Next time I get upset at my husband, I'll say something kind. Next time I get upset at my husband, I'll say something kind. You program that. And then you go around your daily tasks. You don't know when, but then (coughs) your husband comes home late or he does something wrong and you're about to get upset and that thought comes up. You're mindful of that thought now. Say something nice and you have a very good chance of changing your habits. You're about to say something awful, but the, mo- the thought comes up, say something nice, and you do. That's the way you can change your habits. And it's very powerful and effective. It's called programming mindfulness. Experiment with it. The most important thing though, you have to give clear instructions. If it's at all ambiguous, then it won't work. It has to be very, very clear and you have to really listen. So play with that. Give it, a, give it a try, especially tonight. Especially tonight when you go to bed, remind yourself, I must. I'll say, I will get up at such and such a time. I will get up at such and such a time. I will get up at such and such a time. And you find it works. Programming mindfulness. Okay, now, the questions today. Number one, how would meditation and mindfulness help in the death process at the point of death? If I'm not an advanced meditator, how do I use meditation techniques and mindfulness at the point of death? This is one way you can do it. You can program your mindfulness. You say to yourself, when I am dying, I will think of the Buddha. When I am dying, I will think of the Buddha. When I am dying, I will think of the Buddha. You try that. If you keep conditioning yourself like that, when you die, you will think of the Buddha. People in the advertising industry use this all the time. They bombard you with these messages and you think it doesn't go in. You forget about them, but it goes in. Which is that's why when you go into the supermarket you buy that particular brand of of, uh, noodles which you saw in the advertising. You buy that particular brand of clothes which you saw on the TV. It works. So now you're going to advertise to yourself conditioning yourself, brainwashing yourself, programming your mind, whatever you call it, you can do it. It's very easy to do. Especially the more strong you are in your meditation, the more powerful your mindfulness, the more effective it is. So that will work for you even better than ordinary people. Because you've trained your mind. What a wonderful thing it is to do. To get a little bit more control of your mind by programming mindfulness. So, you can do that. You can program your mindfulness. For the time of death, this is what I'll do. You'll be surprised. When that moment happens, the automatic conditioning comes up and off you go. The best one is, as I said about that uh, disciple, to program your mind at the point of death, I'm going to say to myself, let go, let go, let go. At the point of my death, I'm going to say, let go, let go, let go. At the point of my death, I'm going to let go, let go, let go. And it happens. 
You get to that point, the brain recognizes this is the time, and the mindfulness starts saying, let go, let go, let go. It's brilliant when you know mindfulness and how to program it. Any questions about that? Okay, next question. Ajahn, I'm still struggling with watching my breath. I feel like I'm actually doing the breathing in and out and after a while get breathless. How does one watch the breath and let the body do the breathing? Please elucidate. This is a test for you because as I said the other day, whenever you watch something, people always like to get in control. If you go to your friend's house and they're cooking something, you say, that's not the way to cook it, this is the way to cook it. If you see somebody on a computer, you say, no, don't do it this way, I know how to do this. And this is one of the problems. Sometimes if you're a young monk and you see someone giving a Dhamma talk, you think, oh, this is what you should say, Ajahn Brahm, not that. <laughs> Whatever we listen to, we always tend to interfere with and control. Now this is actually where we learn how to watch without interfering. To be what's called like the, the silent watcher. Just to be the, the bare awareness, the uninvolved supervisor. And being a supervisor is a very good metaphor. If you're a supervisor at work, you're not supposed to do the jobs your underlings are doing. Your job is just to watch them and make sure they do the work they're supposed to be doing. And if you're a supervisor, you have to be very wise. You have to know all the tricks, all the tricks of your underlings to actually to get away from actually working. The old trick, whenever you're in the office, when you're walking from place to place, always carry a big pack of papers. It doesn't matter if you're using or not, if you go from one office to another carrying a big stack of papers, they think you're working. You can, you can go to the coffee, you can go anywhere else, they think you're working and that means you don't have to do anything. <laughs> or whatever. There's all these tricks which people have to get away from working. And if you're the supervisor, the boss, you have to know all of those tricks. So you know when the uh, underlings, your employees are doing the job and when they're not. And that's what you have to do with mindfulness. You're the supervisor. You have to supervise the breath. But you don't do the breath. All you do is make sure the breath's going in. Make sure the breath's going out, that's all. Because the body will do the breath much better than you can ever do the breath. The body knows it needs a deep breath because it needs more oxygen. It needs, it needs a shallow breath because you, know, you don't need so much oxygen. The body knows what to do. So trust your body and your job is just to stand back and be supervisor. And that's what you do. Another way of doing this is actually to get that objectivity as if mindfulness is over here and the breath is over there. If you get some distance, some space, imaginary space between the object and the watcher, it's much easier to leave it alone. Because you can use the, the simile of like watching a TV or watching a movie. If you're watching a movie and you always remember you're sitting in the seat in the movie theatre and the movie's on the screen over there. If you always remember that distance between the movie screen and you, you'll never get too excited, you'll never get too upset. But when actually you lose that separation, you're right in the screen with whatever's happening. This is what it feels like when you're watching a movie. You're right there. You forget that you're sitting in a seat watching. You're actually part of it all. Which is why when the alien comes in, <laughs> you jump. Or when the music, the violins come and the boy finally meets the girl. Oh, isn't this wonderful? And he gets all romantic and slushy. <laughs> now this is what, hap what happens. Okay, this is crazy, the people's attachments, because they don't want to be objective, especially when they're watching the movie, they want to get involved. Because there's this disciple of mine, she was a, a Chinese Thai girl, and her mother you know, in Bangkok would once a week go and watch the Chinese movies. And every week when she came home from the Chinese movies, her eyes would all be red. 
She'd been crying and crying and crying and crying. Because she told me, I don't know if this is true, you probably let me know, in the Chinese movies, it's the same plot, boy meets girl, and someone gets in the way, either it's the Imperial Chinese Army, or it's the parents, or something happens, and so the boy loses girl, and they come back in the end, and it's almost as if the boy will meet girl after all, and they live happily ever after, but that's the Western movies. In the Western movies, the boy always meets the girl, they live happily ever after. In the Chinese movies, the boy and the girl never meet. <laughs> and it's always so sad. Oh. And you go crying, 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 crying. <laughs> and you like doing that, you're crazy. <laughs> they like crying. But why do we do that? We want to get involved. Now, if you can only remember, it's only a movie, that's all. One of the stories I tell was when I was a student, I remember we went with our girlfriends once, you know, my mates and our girlfriends, we went to see the movie West Side Story. Anyone old enough to know that movie? It was uh, a very famous movie at the time. It was almost like Romeo and Juliet set in New York. And in the very end, there was Tony and Maria, these like lovers from the opposite side of the tracks. And you know, they tried everything to get together. They were in love but they came from different families and there was problems and I think Tony's brother uh, shot Mary's, uh, Maria's uh, uh, brother or something. There was all sorts of problems. And in the very end, so they were just running to... Some was trying to kill Tony and Maria was running to tell him to save him. And it was under the, one of these um, uh, street lights in the Bronx in New York. Tony was waiting for Maria and Maria shouted, be careful! And at that point, the bullet ripped through the, the night and hit Tony. And Maria came running to him and took him in his arms as he was dying. And they started singing, there's a place for us somewhere, sometime, a place for us. <laughs> 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 and what you're doing is what I did. I was laughing. But the girls, they were crying. Oh, this is so sad. It's only a movie. So this is what we mean by attachment and detachment. When you get attached to things, you get involved. And you, you feel inspired when they fall in love. You cry when it doesn't work out. You get afraid when the, you know, the danger starts to happen. So when you're watching the breath, don't get involved in it. Just stand back as if it's somebody else's breath. Nothing to do with you. Then you can leave it alone. You're detaching from your breath. And that's what detachment means. It's not my breath, it's the body's breath. The body does the breathing, I just do the watching. That's what you do, supervisor. Okay, in that way you'll be able to watch the breath. Whatever it does, you can just do it. And you let it go. Don't get involved. So that's a test. You have to keep on trying, find out these skillful means until you can watch the breath without interfering with it. You get the payoff because the breath gets very still and peaceful and you don't have to do anything. You're the supervisor. You don't have to work. Isn't that wonderful? You don't have to do the work yourself. Someone else does it. You don't have to do the cooking today. Someone else does it. You don't have to do the washing up. Someone else does it. Isn't this a holiday? Why do you live every day as a holiday? Like me. Holy days. Every day. <laughs> so you don't get involved. You just watch, especially the breath. Let the body do the breathing. That's a body's job. That's what you've got a body for, to do the breathing. You leave it alone and it does it so well. You can just relax. It's like you can imagine yourself going on either Singapore Airlines or MAS. What do they say as soon as you get on the plane? Do you have to do anything? You've got a pilot and uh, what's it? flight attendants, they do all the work. When you get on the plane, all you need to do is to sit down and do nothing. And what do they say over the intercoms? 
They say, sit down, enjoy the stay over the intercoms. They say, sit down, enjoy the flight and enjoy the in-sight service. Not the in-flight service, the in-sight service. <laughs> That's what you do, enjoy the in-sight service. So you sit down, let go, enjoy the in-sight service. Okay, so try that. Any comments about that? <laughs> yeah. Well, the mental processes. That's coming tonight about the mental processes and anger and all that sort of stuff. So, that's something to look forward to tonight, how to deal with those other things. This is just watching the breath without getting involved in it. Leave it alone. Ajahn, during meditation, sitting or walking, is it necessary that the tongue touches the upper palate? For walking meditation, is there any specific movement for the hand? Okay, no, you can put your tongue anywhere. You can put it out if you like. <laughs> as long as you, your tongue can just be happy. So ask your, ask your tongue where it wants to be. And wherever it wants to be, be kind to your tongue. And just let it be like that. <laughs> this is actually sometimes what I do. When I start meditating, I close my eyes. And actually one of the important things is, especially group meditation, everybody must close their eyes. Don't keep your eyes open. One of the important reasons is if we know that we've all got our eyes closed, that if you've got any itch on a, an important part of your body, you can scratch it knowing no one's looking. <laughs> if you want to pick your nose, you know that no one can see you. So you say, the, point, the, point, the point is that you just try to get your body comfortable. However it's comfortable. So what I do sometimes, I ask my feet, feet, are you happy down there? Now it's not being stupid because when you actually ask that question of a part of the body, mindfulness goes down there and you get an answer. If you never ask, you're never told. So you ask, feet, are you happy? Knees, how are you going on down there? Now bottom, you comfy? Ask a question. You know, so shoulders, how are you getting on? You know, head, are you okay? And now the person who asks this question always asks tongue. How are you doing in there, in the mouth? <laughs> and then the tongue will answer, yeah, I'm comfortable, I'm not comfortable. Because when you actually ask that question, you look, you're mindful, and then you get the answer. It does not matter where the tongue is as long as it's comfortable. The same with the hands. It doesn't matter where the hands are as long as it's comfortable. You just leave them alone after a while. And that's all you need to do. There is no absolutely correct posture. And I mentioned that the other day when I was had a fever in a hospital. That was that story where that nurse built like a water buffalo would stab me twice a day with the blood needle. <laughs> I had a fever, I was sore, I got in a deep meditation, I was in this really ridiculous posture, it was all over the place, but it worked for me. It wasn't any posture, it wasn't none of the, you know, I was lying on the bed, but it wasn't that little lion posture like you see the Buddha lies down in Kusinara. It was a leg over this way, a leg that way, an arm over here, all over the place. But it didn't matter, for me it was comfortable. And I go into deep meditation as a result. So don't look for other people how they're sitting. Look for yourself. That's why you can sit in a chair. That is fine as long as you're comfortable. Dear Ajahn, is funeral chanting for a deceased person, deceased person important? Can the ceremonies help the deceased person in reincarnation? Thank you. Sometimes I explain that when I do the chanting for a deceased person, I also use that chanting to focus my mind, to concentrate the mind, especially on such things as a metta sutta, to focus my mind on the meaning of metta. I use that as a tool of focusing. And then I can actually spread loving kindness to the one who's passed away. Sometimes it's too much chanting though. If it's too much chanting, you don't hear it after a while. So it's important, it's special chanting, you use it for a purpose. And when you use it for that purpose, it might work. Imagine if it's the person who's listening to it, and the monks chant in Pali. Imagine that I chanted in Pali at your funeral, 
and you were floating above there. You can't even understand the Pali now. How will you understand the Pali when you're dead? <coughs> so the point is that you won't understand the meaning of the words, but you'll understand the meaning behind it, the implicit meaning, which goes from mind to mind. That's why it's a very interesting point of, of um, psychic truth. Because I wondered when I was first a monk, in Thailand, do the Thai ghosts speak Thai? If so, if they came to see me and they said something, they wouldn't be able to scare me because I wouldn't know what the hell they were talking about. <laughs> do the Chinese ghosts speak Mandarin? If they did, they'd go and try and haunt the Malays. <laughs> they wouldn't be able to. What are you talking about? What language does ghosts speak? <laughs> Have you had a ghost come to you and say something? Was it in Te Chu or Mandarin or Malay? Or <laughs> it's not. The ghosts speak the language of the mind. So even if you are a Westerner and you've got this old Chinese ghost, you'd understand perfectly what he or she said. Mind to mind. That's how the communication works. So because of that, you understand that when a person's a ghost, they just died. It's the same as a ghost, but no, not really a ghost because it's just um, a mind-made body just for the time being. They will understand through the mind. So they may be, may be an old grandmother who ha can't speak English at all. You get a monk like me to give a sermon. They will understand what I say. Because it's mind to mind. So yeah, it can be, it can work. Any questions about that? No? Good. <laughs> Why does some monks disrobe? Ajahn Jakru, who was abbot of Perth Monastery in the past, suddenly disrobed. Can you explain a bit? No, that's a hard one. Why do monks disrobe? I disrobe every day before I go into the shower. <laughs> <laughs> that's not real disrobing. Why do some monks leave the monk good? Actually, the, I've been a monk for many, many years now. 30 years I've been a monk, just over 30 years. And so I've seen many monks disrobe, and these are my friends, and so I know exactly why they disrobe. Now, first of all, there's the explanation or the excuse why they disrobe. And please know the excuse is very rarely the reason. The real reason why they disrobe is one thing. The excuse they give is something else. The real reason, or the real reason why a monk disrobes is because they haven't got enough happiness. Because when you become a monk, or a nun, you start off with inspiration. You've got so much faith in a Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. You've got so much inspiration in a path of renunciation. And that inspiration gives you happiness for many years. But after a while, like anything else, the inspiration wears off. It's there to start giving you another source of joy. And that source of joy has to be from your meditation. If your meditation takes off and you have happiness in your meditation, like some people here have already got some happiness in their meditation because I've watched them smiling, then you don't want to disrobe anymore because you've got a happiness which is so wonderful and so beautiful. Why do you want to go back to the world? Remember, like for monks, some of the very young monks, they can't just be apart from seeing girls and pretty girls, because you live in the world. I mean, Ajahn Chah once said, when he was a young monk, like any other young monks, he had lust. And so he decided for three months not even to look at a woman for the range retreat. And he'd always look down. He would never look to the left or the right. If he thought there was a woman somewhere, he wouldn't look at them. And, of course, he didn't have any lust for those three months. Didn't see anyone. Once his determination, resolution was finished, he finished the three months, the first girl he looked on, wow, bam. <laughs> he had so much lust. And he realized that's not the way to deal with it just by not trying to look at these things, because they're there, you'll eventually see it, 
As a monk, you have to deal with that. And the way you deal with it, the best way, this is according to the suttas, you get the happiness of meditation. And when you've got the inner happiness, you don't look for happiness outside. It's the psychology of your mind that will always look for happiness. And if you deprive it of happiness, it will go somewhere to find happiness. You've already experienced this in your meditation. If you're not happy in the moment, the mind will start thinking about something else. Or fantasize, dream of the past, plan the future. Why does it do that? It's because you're not happy now. That's why. Once you're really happy in this moment, you just don't want to think about anything else. You're still. Happiness is the key to meditation. It's the key to life. It's the key to enlightenment. It's happiness. When a monk is happy, they never want to disrobe. And that happiness which comes within from meditation gets so strong. You can look at pretty girls, you can be with pretty girls, but you've got the inner happiness, so the mind never goes out to lust. It doesn't want happiness outside, because it's got enough inside. It's not hungry, so it never wants the food of the outside world. It's got the inner food. That's why monks stay as monks. Which is why it's very good when a monk is a young monk to protect them to manage to give them the strength in their meditation, the strong states of mind, and once they get established in the inner happiness, then they're safe. Doesn't matter where they go. And it's actually good fun being a good monk. Because sometimes you can see these incredibly pretty girls. And they get very upset at you. You know why? You don't look at them. <laughs> oh. Because if you're a very beautiful girl, that you get used to all these guys looking at you all the time. And when a guy comes along and just treats you just as someone ordinary, what's wrong with you? <laughs> this happened to me <laughs> about a few years ago. I, was going to, I went to this uh, meditation group in Sydney, a very expensive part of Sydney. It was actually Double Bay. And in this meditation group was, say, a TV star. This girl who goes in many, many TV programs, she's very famous, very well known, very beautiful, but I don't watch the TV. I didn't know who she was. So when I started giving this talk, she was looking at me <laughs> and smiling. And I, I, I don't know, what's she on about? I don't know. And I was looking at other people and just giving a talk as usual. And she got very upset because I didn't recognize her. I didn't say, ah, there's that so-and-so, she's in the movies. Because <laughs> she was so used to being recognized. That was her pride, that was her ego. And when I as a monk just treated her as an ordinary person, she was very upset. <laughs> there's also, there's this story, I saw this in one of the newspapers, when George Bush the I, you know, when he was the, uh, just became elected as the President of the United States, he went to, uh, to visit... Um, uh, UK and he was at a cocktail party like a reception and this English lady came up to him and said who are you? <laughs> <laughs> he was so upset he said I'm oh, the President of the United States oh come on don't joke <laughs> <laughs> and he was <laughs> so you get very upset when you don't recognise so anyway back to being like a buck if you've got inner happiness, you'll never disrobe. If anyone wants to check that one out, that's called in the Sandaka Sutta. So the consolations of being a monk. He said if you get into the first jhana, that's the first consolation. You've given up a lot. You've given up no sex. You've given up family. You've given up no movies, TV, and all those sensory pleasures. You've given up eating whatever you like, when you like it. In return, if you get those deep meditations, Ananda said that's the first consolation for being a monk. Once you have that, chances are you'll never disrobe. That's why monks disrobe, why they stay. So be kind to the monks who disrobe. They've tried their very best. It's not an easy life. 
But if they get that deep meditation, they're going to be monks forever. Any questions on that? Next question. It's also not just the deep meditations, also the other consolations of the stages of enlightenment, stream winner and above. If you become a stream winner, this the Buddha says, even if the king comes with all his fortunes, you still don't want to disrobe. So if you're a stream winner or got Savajana, you're never going to disrobe. <coughs> Dear Ajahn, would it be possible to end the morning chanting with a sh- short session of metta meditation led by you? Thank you. It would be possible, but if people wanted it or not, I don't know. So, okay. Is it nice in the morning, loving kindness meditation? Who thinks, no, uh, we should have, let's have a show of hands. Who thinks we should have a short meta meditation after morning chanting? Put your hands up. Okay, those who don't think you should have a short meta meditation after morning chanting, put your hands up. (laughs) I get outvoted, okay. In the evening, yeah. It's usually nice to do because sometimes in the morning people are a bit tired. But I don't know, we might do it in the morning. Who prefer it in the, the morning rather than the evening? Put your hand up. Okay. Who prefer it in the evening rather than the morning? Now I think the mornings win. <laughs> that could be the morning. Okay, we'll try that tomorrow morning. Next question. Isn't that putting effort in being in the mind to present moment and being with the one who knows one acts, our uh, acts of doing. Thank you, Ajahn. Now, outside meditation time and daily life, how much should we get involved with the doer? Okay, outside of meditation, when you're active in the world, where you're doing your duties, you have to do that the best you possibly can. 100% effort. But not just effort, wise effort. Because wisdom is the most important thing with effort. You can be very, very strong. You can be the most powerful person in the world and still create lots of trouble. It's important to be wise as well as strong. And wisdom is one of the great strengths. So make sure it's wise, compassionate as well as doing things. But (coughs) when you bring the mind to the present moment, it's actually the opposite of doing. It's letting go of doing. You may make that resolution, okay, I'm going to come into the present moment. But really you're doing letting go. You're abandoning the future, you're abandoning the past. It is an act of letting go. Which is why that sometimes people look at the monks and say, you monks, you're just attached to being a monk. And that's a really stupid thing to say. This is letting go. It's like saying, you're attached to letting go. So anyone who tells me, you're attached to being a monk, and I say, yeah, and you're attached to being a layperson. <laughs> you said it first. You give up your layperson, first of all, come be a monk. And if you've been a monk for about ten years, then I'll go be a layperson. (laughs) Of course, I would never be able to do that. Because the point is, this is letting go, this is attachment, this is detachment. But sometimes we don't know the difference between attachment and letting go. And this is something even the Buddha said, that sometimes ordinary people, deluded people, what's detachment, they say, is attachment. They say, what is attachment? They say, it's detachment. They don't know the difference between the two. Real detachment is freedom. It's letting go, not getting involved. Disengaging. Monks disengage from the world. That's why it's called detachment. We disengage from our body, which is why it's called meditation. We disengage from samsara, which is why it's called enlightenment. All stages of letting go. So please know what's attachment and what isn't. If you put effort to bring the mind to the present moment, it's like holding the mind like this. Keeping the present moment or else. You never won't be able to do it. You let go, you put down the past. You put down the future. You let go of those two things. The only thing you've got left is now. This is what happens when you let go of time. You're in the present. So it is an act of letting go, not an act of attachment. Okay? Next question. Here we go. Can you advise us on how we could be more interested in watching our normal and uninspiring breaths moment to moment? 
Wow. Your breasts are not uninspiring. They are literally... Wow. Your breasts are not uninspiring. They are literally inspiring. Respiring means breathing. Inspiring means breathing in. You inspire and you outspire. Actually, you don't outspire, do you? You expire. <laughs> don't, don't do that. You can inspire, but don't expire, please. But that's actually, this is where the word expire comes from. Aspire, like respiration, spirit. This is what the original English meaning is. Breathing. It's to breathe, to have spirit. It's to breathe. Inspiration is actually to be breathing in and out. Expiration, when the last breath goes out, that's it. <laughs> so, so, if you're really inspired, it means you're breathing. Breathing is by its etymological meaning, it's inspiring. <laughs> but the point what you're trying to say is that to be interested in it, you put interest in it. It's fascinating, this breath. If you're really mindful, you'll find that no breath is the same. I don't know how many millions of breaths you've breathed since you were born, but there's no two breaths which are exactly the same. Every breath is unique. There's like, you now every being in this room is unique. Even though there's a couple of twins here, you are unique. Your mother knows your difference very easily. You think your breath is twins, but no, everyone is unique. And it's important to you. If you go and visit someone who's sick, the nicest piece of advice to stop them dying is keep on breathing. <laughs> That's a good piece of advice when someone's sick. <laughs> so what's actually happening there? The breath is important to you. It's your vehicle. It's like a car. So in order to make it more interesting, you can do loving kindness with the breath. Bring the two together. Look upon your breath like a baby, like your baby, like your child. Imagine that, you know, well, men and women, men have become very good these days looking after children. Imagine you've got a child in your arms, your baby, your maybe three or four month old son. You're cradling in your arms as you go shopping. Would you drop the baby somewhere and forgot where you dropped it? <laughs> Would you leave it at the shops and go home and say, oh, where did I leave my baby? That's what you do with the breath, isn't it? You're breathing in, but you drop it somewhere. You haven't got a clue where you left it. <laughs> Why is that? Because you don't care about your breath. So you look upon your breath as being your darling little child. Oh, this little breath. And yet you can imagine rocking it, breathing in, breathing out. Breathing in, breathing out. Oh, so sweet. Breathing in, breathing out. It's beautiful, baby. <laughs> when you do that, because you have care, you've got kindness, you have love towards your breath. You imagine it's a little baby. You'll find it's very easy to watch your breath. Now sometimes when I'm giving a talk or we have a dana, somebody brings their new child to be blessed. This is a little uh, couple of month year old kid. When I was in Singapore, there's a couple of disciples just gave birth um, to their children and they came to bring them for me to bless. And as soon as they brought this little baby in, I noticed even though I was visiting from overseas, I was not the centre of attention anymore. The baby was. <laughs> You know what you girls are like? Any baby, oh, you love them. Oh, please let me hold it. Oh, isn't it sweet? Oh, isn't it lovely? Now you understand. If you can have the same uh, feeling towards the breath, it becomes your centre of attention. Oh, you love looking at this little baby and so sort of seeing it smile. Or go, oh, look, it's smiling. Oh, isn't that cute? Like the breath. <laughs> like, the, like the breath. Oh, it's just going in. Isn't that cute, the way it goes in? Oh, it's charming. Look how it goes out. Oh, it's so sweet. If you, <laughs> if you look at the breath that way, it becomes interesting. Your attention is just so easy. In fact, it's hard to take you away from your breath. So do loving kindness on the breath. 
Look upon his like a being, it's beautiful little baby. So important to you. You have loving kindness on the breath. Breath, adore my heart, serpent to you. I care for you. Then you start watching the breath. And when you're actually cradling a baby, they always see these girls or these men looking at a little baby and they smile. They're happy. Loving kindness on the breath brings you happiness. And that happiness keeps your attention there. When your attention gets there, the breath stays and it gets so peaceful, so beautiful, it's even more attractive than a baby. That's how you can make it interesting. Look upon the breath as being a little baby. After all, it comes from your womb as it comes out. And it goes back into your womb again. It's like a joey, like a kangaroo. Because the kangaroo, when they have little joeys, they go out of the, the pouch and back in again. Out and in, just like the breath. <laughs> okay, so that's how you can make the breath more interesting. Next question. How do I set up a simple altar at home? All right, easy, you just put it up, put the Buddha statue on top. <laughs> you don't have to do it. Those of you who think of it, oh, I have to put it in the right place. What if it's in the wrong place? If it's in the wrong place, you will know. One of my disciples in Perth came to see me one morning. They were very perturbed. Because what had happened was this. They'd set up their altar. It was in the, the hallway as they went into the, the living room or the dining room. No, the living room, the lounge room, sorry. After setting up their altar and putting some, I think some fruit in there or some incense and lights or whatever, when they came down the following morning, they seen, they saw, they noticed their Buddha statue had twisted round. So they thought it must have been their son had maybe knocked it or something. So they straightened up again. And they came down the following morning, the next day, it had twisted round again. That really made them spooked. So they asked their son, did you do anything? He said, no, I didn't. So they thought, oh, who knows? So they strained it out again. And the third morning, it had also moved. Ah! <laughs> this is supernatural. So they came and saw me. <laughs> and I said, where you put it? You know what they'd done with it? They put it in front of a mirror. And it had moved by itself. Buddhist statues don't like being in front of mirrors. Because it's against the rule for a monk actually to look at yourself in the mirror just for vanity. If it's to shave yourself, it's okay. And he put it in front of a mirror and it moved. So any of you who get concerned whether you're putting the Buddha statue in the right place or the wrong place, if it's the wrong place, you will know about it. <laughs> it will move. <laughs> So you can set up an altar, but you can actually feel it where it's the right place. And it'll be, as long as it's a high place, a respectful place, that's good enough. Is it considered disrespectful to adorn Buddha images in the bedroom? You can adorn them as long as you, know, you feel that this is appropriate. In other words, you, you, know, you adorn them with like flowers or something, but you know, not with um, silly things you know, like um, tattoos or anything like that, or studs. I've seen that people these days, they sometimes put, you know, no, you know the, in the West they put nose studs, piercing, this here and that. That's not how you to adore a Buddha. And tattoos are really in, in Western countries. They're really cool. All these people have got tattoos all over the place, but you don't tattoo a Buddha. <laughs> so you adore it in an appropriate way. And three, I have noticed some restaurants decorate their premises with Buddha statues. Your comments please. As long as it's in a high place, and the restaurants don't serve alcohol. It's not really nice actually to serve alcohol in such a restaurant. Because the Buddha's there. So it's best actually, if it's like Buddhists own that restaurant, they want a Buddha in there to inspire them, then put it in the office somewhere. Not where people are just um, doing un-Buddhist things like drinking alcohol. Or if it's some of these seafood restaurants in the West where they put these lobsters in the, in the water and you choose your own lobster to be, to be boiled to death basically. And that's not right to have a Buddha statue there. So keep the Buddha statue away somewhere else. Next question. Here we go. Dear Ajahn, what is life? Okay. 
Life is what happens between being born and dying. <laughs> Question two. Question one. How do we realize, visualize the breath? Is the flow of air or the rise and fall of the ribcage? You don't visualize it. It manifests for you. So it's just how it wants to present itself to you. However it wants to present itself, you accept it as it is. You don't tell it how it should manifest. You don't tell it breath, you better uh, rise and fall on the rib cage or else. You don't tell it breath, you must be at the tip of the nose. You don't tell it anything, you're kind to the breath. So breath, however you want to manifest to my consciousness, that's fine with me. The door of my heart is open to you, no matter how you manifest, no matter where you um, manifest on my body. So this is where you don't demand the breath to be this way or that way. To be someone who's content, easily satisfied, not demanding in nature. Question two, what comes after the counting of the breath? What can we expect as we keep focusing on the breath? You don't, can't expect anything. <laughs> don't expect things. You just count the breath after a while, you just let go of the counting, you're left with the breath. The counting is just there to give you an opportunity to focus. Once you've focused, the mind is latched onto that, let go of the counting, make it disappear, so you just feel the breath. Without giving it a name, just feel the breath. You know the breath, it's going in, it's going up. Actually, what happens next, I didn't make this quite clear in the instructions. First of all, you just know some of the breath. It's just when I first look at you, I can see, oh, now that's Amateur, that's Raymond, that's this, that's that. But as I look at you more closely, I get more details of who you are. I notice more of your features, your clothes. Now what it means here, when you first watch the breath, you just see in, out, in, out, in, out. As you look at the breath more, you see it's not just in, out. You see the in has got a beginning. You start to see the very beginning of an in-breath. You start to see it actually grow to its peak and then fade away as the last piece of air enters your body. The last moment of the in-breath. And then you notice there's a pause between the in-breath and the out-breath. You're neither breathing in nor you're breathing out. And then you start to, to experience the breath being exhaled. You notice the very beginning of the out-breath. You see force of the exhaled air gets stronger and stronger and then when most of the air is exhaled the air out breath declines gets weaker and weaker as the out breath is finished and then there's another pause but for me it's not as long the pause between the out breath and the in breath it's never as long as the pause between the in breath and the out breath but for you it may be different but you see that pause you start to see the whole of the breath. Just like I can see you're a girl, you're a boy, you're more than a boy. You see the colour of your hair, your size, the robes or the clothes you're wearing. You start to see more detail. And as you watch the breath more and more, you see more of its detail. It's called filling the whole mind with the breath. And it fills the mind so much you find actually it is incredibly interesting. You actually can play around and ask yourself, which is the longest pause between the in-breath and the out-breath or the out-breath and the in-breath? Does it reach its peak in the middle or is it towards the end when it's the in-breath is going in fastest? How does it work? Are they all the same length of time? Is the in-breath the same duration as the out-breath or what? You start to really get interested in this breath. And as you know it more and more, you don't get involved in it, you don't control it. You're being like a scientist. You don't control the experiment, you just to watch and gather the information without disturbing. And when you actually start seeing this, the breath fills the whole mind and it gets so peaceful, it starts getting very still. The next stage which happens, sometimes people think they've lost the breath, but you haven't. You don't know whether it's going in or going out. Because what happens next is best explained by a simile given by Buddha Gosha. He probably got the simile from someone else, but it's a brilliant simile. It's a simile of a carpenter sawing a piece of wood. 
If you start sawing a piece of wood when you first watch, you're focusing obviously on where the saw hits the wood. When you first start looking at that, you can see the handle of the saw, you can see the far tip of the saw, the end of the saw. But as you focus in, after a while, you, just like the simile of the bird being shot through the eyeball, after a while, all you can see is that part of the saw just touching the wood. You can only see one or two teeth and just that little piece of wood where the saw is hitting the wood. And therefore, you don't know after a while whether that tooth, that saw tooth, is at the beginning or the end of the saw. All you see is one saw tooth meeting the wood. The attention has become focused and refined. It's the same with the breath. After a while, you don't see in-breath, out-breath. You just see this one moment of breath happening now. This instant of breathing. And you can't tell whether it's in-breath or out-breath. It's no longer important. It's just breath. After a while, you get used to that feeling. Because sometimes you think, I've lost a breath. You haven't lost a breath. You've lost the perception of in and out. But you're still watching the breath. What you can do is, if you think you lost your breath, that which I was aware of, what was it? If you've got enough insight, you notice that was the breath. It's only it's changed its appearance. Its inness and outness are no longer recognized. It's just breath. You're getting more and more refined. And that breath becomes so still, it soon transforms into happiness. Quite seamlessly, and you ask yourself, what am I watching? Happiness. But what's that to do with the breath? I'll tell you what it's to do with the breath. It's the way the mind is knowing the breath rather than the body feeling the breath. There are six senses, remember. And you can actually experience the breath through one of two sense doors. The sense of physical touch or the sense of mind knowing. What's happening here is you're transferring the perception from a physical touch to a mental knowing. It just happens by itself. You're not feeling the breath anymore. You're knowing the breath. And that knowing is usually manifested as a beautiful, happy feeling. That's how the mind knows the breath. You're just happy. People ask, what should I do? I've lost the breath. Don't disturb the process. Sit down, do nothing, and enjoy the insight service. That's all you need to do. So, don't do anything. After a while, you recognize that you are watching the breath. It is happening. But the breath is changing its appearance. You just stay with that happiness. And it grows and grows and grows. That's where limiters come. That's where you see the mind. The whole purpose of meditation, letting go of time, letting go of the internal commentary, the thinking, letting go of the body and its five senses. So there's no more seeing, smelling, tasting and touching. All you're left with is the mind. It's going to the world of the mind by turning off the switches of the five senses of thinking and time. That's the whole purpose of this meditation, to get into the mind. Okay, great question. Any comments on that? Okay, next question. My goodness, it's not one question, it's a whole essay. <laughs> Can you please show your wisdom, explain the difference between meditation, contemplation, reflection? Contemplation is thinking, reflection, you can reflect upon anything, so the data is not sufficient. So contemplation is just thinking. Reflection is you have some data and you try and understand it. What meditation is, you're getting the very refined data. You are calming the mind, going in and seeing what's inside of you. So you don't contemplate or reflect at the beginning of an experiment. When you're a scientist, you're doing an experiment, you're taught, do the experiment first. Objectively, collect all the data, but don't interfere with the experiment while it's in process. 
if you try and make a conclusion before you've got all the data in, you will skew the experiment. This is why that sometimes people, when they're doing an experiment, they know what they want to prove. They know what they want to prove. So any uh, data, any results, any readings which do not agree with what they want to find, they rub them out. They don't even record them. They just throw them away. And that's why you never find truth. You only find what you want to find. To be fair, to be rational, to be wise, you have to be objective, have no vested interest at all in what you're finding, and to take down the data objectively and fairly. So you don't contemplate or reflect yet. You gather data first of all. And only when you've gathered the very fine data of stillness and peace, then you contemplate, then you reflect. Contemplation and reflection are best done at the end of the meditation, at the end of the experiment. When you've got all the data in, then you think, what was that, what did that mean? That's when insight arises. Not at the beginning of the meditation, not in the middle, at the end. So I'll talk about that later when I give some more teachings on insight meditation. But this is what we do. Oh, actually, you've got some other questions here. That's the difference between meditation, contemplation, and reflection. Two, I try my best to meditate throughout the retreat, but sometimes when saturation comes, is that possible? Can we move back to contemplation and reflection? Or will that ruin the whole purpose of meditation and retreat? No, you can contemplate and reflect. You can have what I call playtime. Just when you were a young girl, a young boy, when you were at school, you'd go to school, your lessons early in the morning, mid-morning you'd have playtime. And then you'd go back to class, then you'd have lunch, and then in the mid-afternoon you'd have playtime again. Why do they still have playtime in college, in universities, in schools? Because you can't expect to be able to concentrate on the lessons for 24 hours a day. If you did, the kids will go crazy. Which is why we, even in the retreat, we have playtime. This is part of playtime. This is why I tell funny stories. Because when you laugh and you relax afterwards, you relax, you haven't been trying to meditate and you can meditate much better afterwards. While we have lunch, while we have a rest after lunch. So give yourself playtime. A cup of tea. Or do some walking. Don't be serious and strict 24 hours of the day. It just does not work. And these great forest monasteries where these amazing monks, I thought I'd have to be mindful 24 hours of the day. But I saw people like Ajahn Chah and he wasn't serious. When it came to tea time, it was fun time, rest time. Even the most serious and strict meditation master, Ajahn Mahabua, when I went to visit his monastery, he had to be very mindful all day. But when it came to tea time, he sat down with the monks and told jokes. And I, couldn't, I couldn't believe that. His reputation was being really fierce. But when it came to tea time, okay, rest. And it was wonderful because he knew, as now I know, that is the way to develop peaceful states of mind. If you keep trying, trying, trying all the time, you won't be able to do it. You'll get dull, you, your mind will rebel. As one person said the other, um, during the interview time, your mind goes on strike. <laughs> you just can't do it. So have playtime. You have playtime, the mind gets refreshed, you take up the task afterwards and you can carry on making progress. There might come a time when your meditation really gets hot. You don't need playtime then, but it becomes natural, effortless. You just keep, want to keep on meditating. If that happens, marvellous, carry on. If you feel you need playtime, you're getting a bit dull, things aren't working, have playtime. The third, can a person who has got good meditation practice 
and experience still not practice good human values and loving kindness? Thank you. I think it's impossible. If someone's got good meditation practice, they have to have loving kindness. Because loving kindness is part of letting go. That's what letting go is, kindness. Generosity is letting go. You know, I've said this before, we don't have donation boxes in my monastery in Perth. We have letting go boxes. We have met meta boxes. <laughs> so people can practice meta, letting go. <laughs> Very good. The facts, my goodness. I'll let it go. <laughs> so this is actually how we practice. And if we really practice it well, it is letting go, it is um, better. So if you really are practicing well, that's a sign that you've understood something, you're getting peaceful, you get so much kindness. When you're very peaceful in meditation, no one can make you angry. This is actually why sometimes we test people out. If they've got a good meditation, they come and say, I jump from I just got into jhanas. I say, you stupid idiot. Someone like you can't. You're getting it all wrong. That is not jhana. And if they say, what? Who are you to say that? I say, yeah, right, you're not jhana. But if they, <laughs> if they say, oh, okay, Ajahn Brahm. That might be. <laughs> because when you're really peaceful and soft and calm, you can't get upset. You've got so much happiness, so much peace. It's like a person has won the Malaysian lottery and you're a millionaire. How can you get upset if you're a millionaire? Oh, life is so wonderful. Or if you've fallen in love. If you've fallen in love, you find your spiritual partner in life. And you find you've got the sack. Who cares? I'm in love. You can't get upset when you're that happy. It's the same. Getting into deep meditation is better than being in love. Oh, so nice. You just can't get upset. And you see other people. Oh, how can I help you? So you get lots and lots of compassion and kindness and generosity when you get in deep meditation. Next question. Can you please explain a bit on the third and fourth links of dependent origination? What is the difference between consciousness, third link and number rupa? Fourth link. Any overlapping? Thank you. Okay, what's actually happening there? That consciousness is like the passive side of the mind. Nama Rupa is the active side of the mind. But it's also the object of consciousness. You know, of Nama Rupa, one of the most important things of that is Chaitanya, will. Also Manasikara, attention. It's what the mind does. Look at Nama Rupa as the objects of consciousness Consciousness is actually the screen. Nama Rupa is the the movie on the screen. The point is here, you can't have a movie without the screen. You can't have, well, you can have a screen without the movie, but it's like a, a white screen. But it's still, you have to have something on the screen. You can't have consciousness without an object of consciousness. You can't have an object of consciousness without consciousness. That's why it's called, they're de- mutually dependent. If you want to ask more about that, you can come up later. Ben Ajahn, can I elaborate the skill and ways of getting into the center of pain, physical and mental? In meditation, what is in the center of pain? Aha, I'll ask the last question first. In the center of pain, there is nothing. Emptiness. That's why it's a great place to hang out. So, you can, to go in the center of pain, again, Notice the flow of the mind which is always going away from things. We go away from this moment. We can't wait to have lunch. We go away from this. I want to get rid of this body. Go somewhere else. I want to get rid of this moment. I want to go into thought. We're always going away from things. We're always on the run. That's called the movement of the mind. Instead of going away from things, we go into things. We go into the moment, we go into the silence, we go into the body where there's no more body left. We go into the center. We go into the middle of pain. Notice when you have pain, there's always that tendency to go somewhere else, to run somewhere else, 
to try and get rid of that pain not to accept it but to get rid of it that's why it gets worse two parts of pain the mental part and the physical part the mental part is I don't want this why me when's this going to go it's not fair that's the mental part of the pain the complaining the physical part is just that just feeling if you run away from the pain it gets worse if you go towards the pain move the mind towards it rather than away you find it gets less and in fact if you can break into the center of it it disappears altogether try present moment awareness with the pain go into the center of time with the pain just now because this pain is already here it's come you can't get rid of it because it's here in the present moment there's no problem with pain anymore you're stuck with it it's only when we think how long is this going to last I can't stand it any longer when we involve time with pain it gets worse you know I remember going to see movies when I was a young boy if I became a monk sometimes they would just take this person into the torture chamber and they'd tell this, po- this person after we finish with you you'd wish you'd never been born heard that before? yeah after I'm finished with you here you'd wish you'd never been born you're a Buddhist you don't want to be born again <laughs> the whole point to wish you'd never been born <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have to look for torture for that because life is torture there's always aches and pains and stuff going on when you realize the first noble truth when you really understand the truth of dukkha yes you'd wish you'd never been born <laughs> but the point is here that uh, suffering when we go into the center of it it gets less and less and less and less so go in the center of time that's one of the ways into the center of pain I'll leave it there for now are there I've got two are there specific meditations to help us control anger, attachments and jealousy yep, meta meditation overcomes anger letting go meditation attaches, uh, let's go of attachments not me, not mine, not the self and jealousy, you say again from anatta what are you being jealous about? Because it's not me, not mine, there's nobody in here. So who wants to be jealous? The other one is like mudita. So if someone else becomes enlightened, isn't that wonderful? The person sitting next to you has become enlightened before you have. Oh, isn't that wonderful? You've got one more enlightened being in this world. Stop thinking, why them? I am good as her. I, look, she hasn't even got up in the morning and she's already in line. It's unfair. I've worked so hard. Oh, I've gone through so much pain. I've gone through so many retreats. And this is their first retreat and they've got enlightened. It's not fair. <laughs> so don't think like that. <laughs> so those are some of the meditations. Metta obviously gets rid of anger. Actually, all these meditations, they get rid, rid of everything. If you do metta meditation, breath meditation, letting go meditation, all the defilements are all abandoned by every meditation. As Buddhists, we are supposed to look inward so much so that we can become self-orientated. No, no self-orientated. <laughs> they got self-orientated. Whereas our Christian friends are so warm, kind, and ever ready to lend a helping hand and reach out to others, as long as you convert. <laughs> Because there's a price tag on some Christian compassion. They'll be kind to you as long as you convert and agree with them. So it's not real kindness. If it's real kindness, I'll be kind to you even if you stay as a Buddhist for the rest of your life. Now, if that's your Christian friend, you've got a fine Christian friend. Someone who really understands Christianity. A lot of time it's just a means to an end. It's compassion to get converts. That's why as a Buddhist you should be kind and compassionate and reach out to your Christian friends, your Muslim friends, your Hindu friends not wanting to convert them at all. I'm going to be kind to you, care for you as a Muslim. I don't want you to change. 
I love you for who you are. And that's what compassion is. If it's I'm being compassionate to you, as long as you come to my church, as long as you change who you are, that's not compassion, that's sneaky business. <coughs> and Buddhists are compassionate and warm. We do reach out. No, I've reached out all the way from Perth to come to KL. That's a pretty long hand. And I've just seen on the boards over there, you're reaching out with orphanages. You go to, uh, to was it, to Burma, people go to India, they help out orphanages, they help out with old people's homes. We give our organs to others. Some of the Christians don't like giving their organs. We reach out, we give even our body for others. So don't downplay the compassion of Buddhists. Buddhists are incredibly compassionate. And I think the Buddhists are the most compassionate people in the world. Because when we give, we never make a big fuss and bother about it. We build hospitals, we actually support hospitals, but we don't put a big cross on it to say, look, this is what we've done. We're humble givers. And sometimes people mistake that for not giving at all. We are incredibly compassionate. How do we apply mindfulness to our daily activities? You don't apply mindfulness, it happens. As you get more and more peaceful, you get more and more aware. As you get more and more aware, you see more things. As you see more things, mindfulness just happens. Not just mindfulness, but wisdom as well. You see what needs to be done. You're sensitive to the people around you. You're sensitive to the needs of your husband, your wife, your parents, your children. Mindfulness happens. You're aware. You're alert. Please give some practical guidelines of how to follow up with our meditation after this retreat. We haven't ended yet. <laughs> My goodness, whoever wrote this is already six or seven days ahead of themselves. You may not have a time after this retreat. You may die on this retreat. <laughs> or you may get enlightened on this retreat. And if you get enlightened, you won't go back to your family. You say, Ajahn Bam, please ordain me. So you may not have it after this retreat. It might go on forever or never. So leave that all on alone. Ajahn Bam, you were saying effortless today. What do you mean by that? How do you use the right effort? Is it the same? Aha, uh -huh. effortless is the... Well, look, what are the four right efforts? The four right efforts is whatever it takes to abandon unwholesome states, to keep out unwholesome states, to actually to arouse wholesome states and to maintain those wholesome states you will find that not doing is one of the best ways of fulfilling right effort. Wholesome states come up and they stay. Too much doing and unwholesome states come in your mind. If you strive in this meditation, get frustrated, angry, grumpy, is that a wholesome state? If you let go, abandon, relax, you get wholesome states in the mind. That is right effort according to the Buddha. The Buddha was very wise, the best teacher that ever has been or will be. He said, you define right effort by its results. Whatever it takes to abandon unwholesome akusala states, to make sure they don't arise in the future, to uh, what is it, arouse wholesome states, kusala dhammas, and to maintain them. That is called right effort. Sometimes that people mistake right effort with striving, with worldly effort. This is unworldly effort. You find if you really let go, if you're compassionate, you abandon controlling, wholesome states come up because you're going against craving the source of unwholesome things. You're going against the sense of ego, conceit, self, me, mine, from which all unwholesome states arise. You let go. Ajahn Bhav, is an eight precept of breaking the precepts when he or she uses powder or lotions due to dry skins? Is health drinks, mild and horlicks, tea and coffee considered food? You are not breaking your, your precepts as long as it's just for medicinal purposes. In other words, you've got very dry skin. If you don't put the powder on, it is going to sort of be just uncomfortable for you. But if it's to make you look nice, if you dye your hair because you don't like being white hair, 
if you sort of put stuff over your face because you don't want anyone to see the pimples, or then even if you put some deodorant on because you've got compassion for the person sitting next to you, <laughs> and that's fair enough. <laughs> but it's not, it's not there for <laughs> It's not there just for to make yourself beautiful. It's not there just for to make yourself beautiful. It's out of compassion for someone else. That's okay. Is health drinks, myelonaholics, tea and coffee considered food? It's all right to have vitamin C drinks. You know what vitamin C is? Vitamin caffeine. <laughs> coffee and tea. You can have coffee and tea. It's not considered food. It's considered drinks. That's okay. Usually in some monasteries, we say any milk drinks is not allowable because we're strict. In our tradition, we say no milk drinks. In other monasteries, they say milk is allowable. So when I'm over here, I follow the tradition of being strict on myself, being compassionate on others. That's a wonderful way to practice. Be compassionate to others. Be strict to yourself. So I don't take milk myself, but I allow you, please take some milk. And if it's just that oval tea, it's... Now have that herbal team. If it makes your meditation better, then take it. But don't go on and sort of start taking, okay, you know, we take a bit of rice. We have rice water. Rice water is the same as herbal team, isn't it? Rice water. Same thing really, just like rice milk. They call it rice milk. And then the rice milk gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And then what's the difference between rice milk and rice? You might as well take rice. And when you take rice, well, you know, you might as well have it fried and have it as noodles. And then, well, you've got to have something. It's only just a, you know, a few little vegetables on top. <laughs> and by the end, you have a three-course meal. <laughs> okay. Dear Ajahn, question. When we experience sleepiness or when the mind wanders off, do we return to observe our breathing or leave the mind as it is? Thank you. Be radical. Leave the mind as it is. Allow sleepiness to be. I think, is it tomorrow? I think I'm giving a talk on the hindrances. So I'll leave that question till tomorrow, uh, tonight, isn't it? Tonight, hindrances. So you'll find that answer tonight. So, but the thing is, when I'm giving the talk tonight, please don't be sleepy. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll ask the question again. To please explain the difference between meditation and contemplation. I've done it already. Must or might be in a meditative mode to get into contemplation. Yep. Otherwise, you're just thinking. Oh, next question. Here we go. Please can I answer the following question. What are the different types of meditation available for daily practice? All meditations are available for daily practice. Everything is. Is it absolutely necessary to do walking meditation before sitting meditation? No. You can do sitting meditation between walking meditation, walking meditation before sitting meditation. The only thing which is absolutely necessary is you don't do both at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> we let <laughs> we, we let go by meditating or we let go before we can meditate if it is the latter then how do we do so ok you let go of answering questions like this and then you can meditate <laughs> next question are the limiters always bright for everyone? What if it is a cloudy for some? Does this also mean that there is a lot of taint? Yes, if it's cloudy, you're not bright, you haven't got enough energy. So, make your limiter bright. It gets brighter as it goes along. That's just the way it is. Could you please advise if a person wishes to distribute or donate his or her lifelong savings, which is the way that gives the greatest yield? This question arises in line with your advice on the best but simple way a Buddhist burial could be carried out. Yeah, it's just give your uh, donations where you think it will make the most benefit for the world and where it brings you happiness. Because this is one of the things when the Buddha uh, said for monks, if someone asks you where should we give our donations, the monks should never say, give it to my monastery, give it to my project. Because that's like selfishness. The monk should always answer, as I'm answering now, to the lay person who asked that question, give it to where your mind finds the most happiness. So we can't say, basically, but it gives you a way of finding out. Where will it produce the greatest benefit? Next question. Since Buddha's consciousness no, long, no longer have supports of other four aggregates, consciousness just stop and not extinct. Hence, we can't say whether the noble one Buddha still exists or non-exists. 
either exists or not exists. Is this the right view? Thank you. Okay, that five kanda process, which one day we called the Buddha many centuries ago, that five kanda process is completely stopped, extinguished, no longer manifest in the world. But does that mean the Buddha is no longer here? Sometimes the Christians say, the Buddha is dead, no longer here, but Jesus is alive. Believe in Jesus. And I say, no, the Buddha is still alive. The Buddha is still, you know, the Buddha is still alive? Absolutely, 100%. Have we heard that before? The Buddha is still living. Because <laughs> the Buddha said, he who sees the Dhamma sees the Buddha. He who sees the Buddha sees the Dhamma. If the Dhamma is to be seen, you can see the Buddha. You can see the Buddha here in Chimpaka Buddhist Lodge today. When you see the Dhamma, you see the Buddha. What he meant there was very profound and wonderful. It's not the person you worship, it's the teachings. It's the teachings were the Buddha, not the body, not the five candles, not this being with this um, snail-like hair on the top of his head. That wasn't the Buddha, that was the, the vehicle which the Dhamma, known as the Buddha, manifested in. And it carried it. That's why we don't have guru traditions in Buddhism. If you like Ajahn Brahm's teaching, it's not this body, it's the teachings which are important. So we don't worry about bodies, about five khandhas. It's the Dhamma which is important. So yeah, the Buddha is still alive, because the Dhamma is still alive. So, you can actually put on your cars, on these little stickers, Buddha lives. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> How do we draw the line to be contented and easily satisfied and not be ambitious and seize opportunities to advance oneself materially and in this world? Okay, be contented to be ambitious. Be satisfied to actually to work hard. In other words, do your duties in the world. But don't expect them to be successful. So I work hard as a monk. I work so hard as a teacher. But I'm contented. If you all go to the kitchen and get all the rotten tomatoes and start throwing them and say, Ajahn Brahm, that's the worst talk we've ever heard. Of all the monks I've ever seen, you're the worst. Boo. I'll still be contented and easily satisfied. Because it would be great if no one liked my teachings. If you thought I was the most boring, worst teacher ever, oh, that would be so wonderful. I could go back to my monastery and be peaceful. <laughs> easy. So, I'm contented if I can manage to give great talks, then it's wonderful I can do service to everybody. I can give. But if, I'm not, if it doesn't work, I'm a bad teacher, I'm even just as happy. So you work hard not expecting any results. That's called being contented and easily satisfied. So in your business, which you work at, work hard. It's not just for you, it's for all your employees. It's part of the cogs of society, of the nation. Without you, there would be something missing in life. So you work hard, it's not just for the money, it's for service to society. It's for service to the people you work with. Work is not just a salary. And the salary is not just the numbers which you put in the bank. It's like ability to look after your family, to look after your health, and to make merit in the world. This is what we get money for. To look after ourselves, our family, our country, and also our world, and also our spiritual life as well. Supporting the temples and whatnot. This is why we work hard. So work hard, but don't expect you have to be successful. I know some people, they work so hard, and they, they just about manage to survive. They don't know why other people, whatever they do, turns to gold straight away. They become incredibly rich. So it's really not depending on how hard you work. Lots of other things involved there, like karma from the past. So your job is to be satisfied. Be contented with what you have. You work hard, and if you're successful, you get lots of money, lots of wealth. Be satisfied with that. And share it around. If you work hard, you don't get so much. Be satisfied with that and share the little you have around. That's all you can do.
Can being contented and easily satisfied doesn't mean you do nothing. It means you do your duties. Your duties as a husband, your duties as a wife, your duties as a, as a son or daughter of your parents. You do your duties to your ancestors. You do your duties to your children. You do your duties to your teachers, to your religion. You also do your duties to your nation. When you do your duties, you give them everything you've got. And that's the difference between being content and easily satisfied and being lazy. Remember the thing I told last night about the snake and the tiger and being in between. When it's nothing to do, just enjoy the honey. When it's nothing to do, climb out and escape. Okay, I think that's... I've gone over half past, but I've got most of the questions done. I've only got a few left. So I think I've made a profit today. And actually, I'm very contented and easily satisfied with all of the questions I've answered today. Even though I didn't complete them all, I am easily satisfied. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed that. Is there any questions from the floor before we start the interviews? Going, going, gone. Okay, so you may be going, going, gone as well. May you go from samsara, going, going, deeper into meditation until you're gone, really gone, far gone, gone into Nibbana. Who knows? You just have playtime for an hour and a half. Now your mind will be fresh, living with Dhamma, with inspiration. It's time to go deep inside, to watch the breath. Remember like a little baby? Don't drop the baby. And then you go to deep meditation. Have a wonderful time. Okay, see you later.